us to drop in. Uh, welcome everyone to the first of our festive um, Zoom tastings uh, in the lead up to Christmas. Uh, I'm going to be taking you through six delicious wines tonight. Uh, but first, we'll just um, we'll just give a couple of couple of secs for um, uh, our, our angels to drop in. Uh, here you can see I've already got the Christmas decorations up. I'm uh, in my log cabin at the end of the garden, roaring fire. Um, not really. Um, yeah. Uh, so everyone join, joining in, uh, make sure you say hello to each other in the chat. Um, that's what it's there for. Um, if you've got a question as we go along, um, pop that in the Q&A uh, Q section down below. Um, but this is meant to be a social, uh, fun, informal uh, tasting. So do say hi, talk, talk to each other in the chat as, as we go along. Okay, so as I said, uh, welcome this evening uh, to a very exciting, uh, what I hope will be a very exciting uh, tasting. Thank you for choosing to join us and taste six delicious wines. Uh, rather than um, watching the uh, Bake Off final, which I know is tonight. Uh, that probably cue lots of people leaving this session immediately to go and watch the Bake Off final. Uh, you can record that, you can catch up, stick around, taste some delicious naked wines uh, with, with us here. Um, so while you're all filling in, thank you to everybody who joined us on our first uh, live tour um last week uh yeah last weekend um it was awesome we um we went to leeds we went to london we went to norwich um with three winemakers on stage tasting some wines it was a new format for us um everywhere looked fantastic um uh, and it was a great event so um thanks if you did come along hope you enjoyed it we, we definitely did um i'd also like to say a massive hello to um the nate a lot of the naked team tonight. Um, it's great that we could get uh, a, a, a lot of the a lot of the guys um, along this evening to taste. They're all working super super hard. You know, this is crazy season um, at Naked HQ, getting all your Christmas orders out the door and ready for you. And I've seen on Insta and and everywhere. Um, all of your Christmas um, boxes are being delivered at the moment. I'm enjoying all the, the pets on boxes photos uh, that keep appearing on Insta. Um, so, so that's fantastic. Um, so great to have them along for the ride. Um, so tonight uh, we are, this is the first I said of uh, two festive Zoom sessions um, tonight. And the second one is the 14th of December. That will be with my old dancing partner, Ray. Um, but tonight we're talking fine wine or finer wine. And really, you know, this is about pushing the boat out a little bit at Christmas. If you, if you can't do that at Christmas, I'm, I'm not sure when you can. So I've selected six um, delicious wines um, to maybe sort of you know, upgrade your Christmas experience, some classic, some not so classic. Um, and you will be armed with your little taster, set, uh, taster boxes here. Um, so 100 mils of each of the wines uh, in these little blue boxes. Um, so that's perfect to share between two of you. Um, if you're tasting alone and you, you want to save a bit for later, um, you can do that. You just make a small snip in the bag inside and uh, you can put a little um, clip on the end um, and um, and you can taste along with us as we, we, we taste these delicious wines. Um, so what I was going to say is I thought it would be a bit dry if I was just going to talk to you um, for, for over an hour about these wines. What I thought it would be really fun to get the people that actually made the wines along um, to, to give you the lowdown on those. So I am going to be joined by a few winemakers tonight, which is great news. Um, so I'm feeling pretty thirsty after that preamble. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to get to wine number one. Um, this is Benjamin Laroche Chablis VA Vin. Uh, so it, and I'm joined by the man himself, uh, Benjamin Laroche, um, live from Shabley, hopefully. Uh, ben, are you there? Did, 
to unmute unmute yourself, Ben. Can you hear me now? I can. Welcome along this evening, Ben. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm very well. Thank you. Good. In, in so, cool climate of Sadly is very good. Ah, look at that. Is that. That's a picture of your vineyards behind you? Uh, yes, behind me is a picture of uh, Chablis Grand Cru. You can see that uh, the vineyards are very, very steepy. The slopes of the vineyards, uh, yes, it's very steepy and uh, the exposure to the sun is absolutely perfect. Wonderful. And uh, the picture was during the pruning. You can see somebody behind me and uh, here. Yeah. Burning the wood of the pruning. Uh, yes. It's which we normally start in February, March. Must be pretty cold. Pretty cold when you're pruning in February, yes, and March and Chablis. The colors of the climate in, in winter in Chablis is cool, very cold, but quite sunny and not that humid uh, like somebody could believe. It's very yeah. sunny in, in, in winter, close to Alsatian weather. Wow, wow. That's incredible. Um, but I suppose the um, burn, so there, um, the guy pruning is, or, or the lady pruning is um, burning the, 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 the offcuts from the plants, yes. correct? And that might exactly. help to keep them warm as well. Um, but, uh, but, it helps, but it's also for health reason for the, for the vineyard, because uh -huh. of the, the wood disease. It's better to burn them than, than to leave them on the soil. Ah, okay, right. Oh, that's really interesting. I, I did not know that. Um, ben, before we get started, I'm just going to say, so everybody, we're on wine number one. That's Benjamin Laroche Chablis Vieux Vien. Um, you make a small slit up the box with a pair of scissors and um, you can pour, pour a little bit in the glass. I'm, I'm pouring some in here. Now, Ben, we have got Chablis Vieux Vien 2018. Do you, do you have some there? Are you, are you drinking that? Indeed. Ah, you can't see That's my glass with my... No, uh, virtual. There you go. Mine disappears no, as well. Oh, well, cheers. Um, cheers. So, tell us about this wine. Uh, before telling about the wine, maybe I should tell you a bit about uh, Chablis Appellation. Just as a quick rem reminder of where is Chablis, where it's located in Burgundy. Because the, the location and the climate of Chablis is very important. Uh, it has a, a huge uh, influence on the type of the wine. Um, Chablis is a quite small appellation uh, worldwide in terms of uh, size because it's only 5,000 hectares wow. on, a total, on a total of 28,000 hectares in Burgundy. In Chablis, we produce only white wine from Chardonnay, 100% white wine from Chardonnay divided in four levels in the appellation. To give you a, a, an idea, uh, the, the Bordeaux uh, area is uh, roughly 200,000 hectares compa compared to 5,000 hectares in Chablis. So it's a very- That's quite very, a difference. <laughs> yes, it's a very, very small appellation. Chablis is a village with 20 other villages around. And the, the appellation has been divided in four levels which are Petit Chablis. It's a plain and the plateau around Chablis. Mm -hmm. Chablis. It's more steepy and a better exposure to the sun with a Kimmeridgean soil, a very special soil. The third level is Chablis Premier Cru. There, the vineyards are very steepy and the exposure to the sun is even better. And depending on the location, depending on the environment around, either it can be a lake, it can be a river, it can be a small forest. You have some microclimates. And there, in this level of the appellation, we've got 42 different, what we call climat. In, mm -hmm. in the, the Chablis Premier Cru, there is 42 different climat depending on the plot. Wow. And so 42 forest. different Premier Crus. Sorry? 42 different Premier Crus. Yes. Or, and wow. even in the Premier Cru, you've got subclimates. Mm -hmm. But it's very simple in a way. You can just imagine that you've got uh, small hills and small plots, and really depending on the type of the soil, depending on the environment, depending on the steepness of the vineyard and the exposure to the sun, it changes the type of the grape, it changes the profile of the grape you get, 
And then you've got different style of wine. And this is what we call the terroir, in fact. The terroir, the definition of the terroir is a mix of all these factors in Burgundy. So in Chablis Premier Cru, you've got 42 different climates plus mm -hmm. some subclimates. And Incredible. Level, level number four is Chablis Grand Cru. This is a perfect expo exposure to the sun. It's facing south, very, very steepy on a total of only 100 hectares. Uh, Chablis is the northern part of Burgundy. It's 150 kilometers at the south of Paris or 150 kilometers at the north of Bonn. It's a most... Yeah, I was, uh, sorry, to inter I was going to say, isn't it? I mean, even though um, you sort of group Chablis amongst Burgundy, it's really quite different to Burgundy, isn't it? To the rest of Burgundy, it's, it's much totally, further north. It's totally different. Uh, the common point uh, is, of course, the, the, the type of grape, because in Burgundy, you grow Chardonnay and Pinot yep. Noir for the reds, plus some Aligoté and some Gamay for the main grape var varieties. But because it's really at the north of the rest of the Burgundy, we have a very cool climate. Uh, a very cool climate during the, 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 win uh, the winter, but very hot and summer climate during the uh, sunny climate during the, the summer. So the grapes are very ripe, but a late ripeness. So we have the most fresh and crispy uh, Chardonnay you can have in Burgundy. Uh, the latitude of Chablis is 47 degrees north, three degrees east. So it's it's closer to Champagne than to the rest of the Burgundy. To give you an example from my office here, I'm at 60 kilometers from the beginning of the Champagne region. In terms of style of wine, because it's a very septentrional region, uh, the, the grapes we have are more on the flinty side, more on the crispy style. It's not very exotic. We don't have... Mm -hmm big taste of exotic fruit or lychee or things like that. It's more light. More green flavors. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, apple, pear, uh, flinty notes, um, crispy, and yes, very fresh style of wine. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, also, what is very specific in, in, in Chablis is the spring frost we have. Uh, the spring ah, frost yes. is very important for us. <laughs> and you've had trouble with frosts this year, uh, haven't you? Uh, this year in 2017, in 2017 and 2016 mm. uh, for the last decade. So yes, it's it's a big, big point. Until uh, 1950, roughly, we didn't uh, produce only wine in Chablis because it was not possible to live only with the, with the, with the grapes. Mm. Uh, it's why all, everybody was doing polyculture. And besides the wines, they were doing some, uh, growing some other vegetables or also things like that. But since we developed the frost protection with the, the aspersion on what, or warming up the, the vineyard with, uh, with candles or with heaters, uh, we managed to protect the harvest and to have a, almost, let's say, 70 to 80 percent uh, of a normal harvest every year for the last past 50 years. Yeah, so that's fantastic. So now you can make a, a living every year um, as a vineyard in Chablis, or even though there were, there were terrible frosts this year. Uh, weren't there that caught everyone um, a bit unawares and um, there's a big um, drop in the production of Chablis um, this year in particular um, so everyone you know no, I don't want to cause a stampede um, on the Naked Wines website but um, but do get Chablis while you can because um, you know it, 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 it is a marginal um, a region, grape growing region really isn't it it's quite far north and um, Brilliant. So we, we've chosen to taste tonight the Chablis Vie Vigne um, 2018. Um, how old are the vines in this, in this Chablis and, and what does that do for the wine, in your opinion? Um, alors, first, uh, what you have to know is that uh, old vines, there is no legal uh, regulation behind this world in Europe. There are many regulations in the wine business. 
in the AOP system or AOC, uh, but regarding the name of all the vines, there is no regulation. Mm. In my humble opinion, for serious people, old vines should be at least 25 to 30 years. Uh, these uh, vineyards are, were planted in 1987. Uh, and we replace some rootstock uh, time, time to time in, in, in a vineyard. So the average uh, age of, the, of this vines, these vines is plus or less 40 40 years yeah so well within your well within your um idea of what old vines should be um in fact uh, old vines uh doesn't it depends on the location in chablis in some places in in the south of chablis area uh old vines doesn't give better uh, uh wines than uh, in in the south uh, it, it depends on the type of soil you have. But if you have a, a very calcy soil, uh, not too drained, you have, if you have old vines, it's absolutely perfect because the rootstock goes very, very deeply in the soil and yeah. it extracts the best of the, of, of the specificity of the soil. Deep down and brings out the minerals of the soil. So you really experience the terroir that the, the plants have grown in. Yeah. Exactly. So if you if you look at, at this wine uh, first, you will you will see immediately that the color is quite pale, a pale green color, uh, yep. close to start being close to yellow, but it's a pale color. It's not a very very intense uh, or, or or deep uh, yellow color. It's not golden. It's really really pale. Uh, this is uh, typical from uh, from Chablis wine. Regarding the nose. The first note I have is a bit of uh, pear and hints of uh, citrus. Um, yep. And just behind this, a bit of vanilla, a, a small hint of vanilla. Um, and of, also this, this nose of flinty, yeah. the flinty nose, uh, very specific to, to, to the Chardonnay in Chablis. Uh, yeah, I was it, just going to say I can really um, smell a bit of smoke, a bit of gun flint there. Um, yeah. You, yeah, you imagine that you take two pieces of uh, silex. Yeah, and you make Good. some strike them. Some oh, you're trying to make a fire with it, and you you smell the the rocks, and then you have this nose in the in the glass. Yeah, but everybody will find a different uh, nose because what you find in the wine depends on your memory of what you smelled before. Mm. Of course, if you never did this with Silex, this you cannot find. But of course, everybody can find some, something that is in, in his own memory. Yeah, delicious. And the, the other thing, the other reason I chose it is um, there's a little bit of bottle age on this wine now. It's 2018. And um, so, um, Benjamin, what that does over time, the Chardonnay puts on a bit more weight, a bit more feel in the mouth, a bit, bit more richness. Um, and I think that's when, that's when Chablis starts to become really interesting, doesn't it? Yeah, we, we, have, we have both in this wine. We have, in a way, we are quite close to a Premier Cru style already uh, because we have this uh, crispiness and this freshness in the mouth. Uh, it's very fresh, and we, we have this citrus style, which which refreshes the mouth. But in another way, it's it's becoming coming quite rich. Uh, we can see that uh, with the evolution, we will go on mushroom styles. Uh, and in terms of volume, due to the exposure to the sun of this area, uh, we are we are in in Ben and Lignoel. Um, we used a bit of uh, oak cask. Okay. Wine. Uh, we used 75% uh, roughly of uh, stainless steel uh, vats after the pressing. Just to explain you the process, we do the pressing, we do a mm -hmm. double bash to separate the solid part and the, the, the liquid part of the, of the juice. Uh, this for roughly uh, 18 hours. Then we put a part of the juice in stainless steel and a part in different oak barrels of 500 liters. We start the fermentation and we follow up doing as 
less things as possible during this fermentation. In fact, we are lazy people. We just let people <laughs> with <laughs> what, what, what should be done. Uh, we just control to avoid oxidization. We just do the, we just full the barrels because the par des anges goes out uh, every day. So every day we refill the, the barrels, but that's it. We do not intervene on anything. At the end of the process of alcoholic fermentation, when the yeast have eaten all the sugar and produced alcohol, we do some batonnage time to time, depending on what we want to get. If we want to have something more buttery, we do more bat batonnage. If we want it to be less buttery, we do less batonnage. Mm, that's the stirring around, the moving of the leads, yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's also what we did uh, after the debobage when we selected the, the liquid part with the solid part of, of the on the decantation of the juice. If you leave a bottle of apple uh, juice in your fridge, uh, mm -hmm. you will see after a few days that you have a tr something trouble at the top. It will become clear, clear, very clear, and at the bottom, it will be, it will be like a solid part. Mm -hmm. uh, the debobage when we do the debobage, we take a part of this solid part. On the, on, on the back of the, of the vat. And depending on how much we take at the back of the, this vat, we'll have plus or less volume at the yeah. end of the process. Um, so we do the fermentation, the alcoholic fermentation, then the malolactic fermentation. And only at the end of the process, we decide what we will blend from this initial plot we harvested at the very beginning, what we will blend in terms of percentage of the barrels and percentage of the uh, stainless steel vats. Mm, okay. it's, like, it's like painting. If you, yeah. if you want to, to have a lovely frame, you need to have the good association of colors. So you've got the color of your stainless steel and we will associate a bit of the color of the, the oak barrels. And I personally use only oak barrels of 500 liters because it doesn't give a two, high level of oaky taste. It's just some hints of vanilla, yeah. some, some very crisp, clean. You know, it's like everything. Uh, using oak barrel is not meant to, 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 to make the wine better. It's just to, sh to, to show off what is already good, but to, to, to give a better expression of what is already presenting very well. Uh, yeah, it's like makeup. Uh, it's it's uh, it's just showing what is already beautiful. Wonderful, that's fantastic. Um, sorry to rush there, Ben. Um, we've got some other wines, but that was fascinating stuff. Um, the uh, the Brits have a long lasting love affair with Chablis. I think we're still the number one market. Yeah, um, it, I, I've chosen it. I think it's a classic wine to have at Christmas. It goes great with smoked salmon, in particular fish starters, but also green vegetables, tarts. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what did, what do you enjoy Chablis with at Christmas time? As a last question. Uh, personally, I have two favorites: uh, oysters, definitely. Ah, uh, yes. But it's probably one of the best matching with a very crispy and fresh Chablis. For this no. 2018, I would probably not go for oysters. I would probably go for that one. We, we taste it now. I would yeah. probably go for Saint-Jacques. So it's um, scallops. Yeah. It's fresh scallops. Um, and definitely with a premier cru, for example, I would go for a grilled lobster. Ooh, Always wonderful. something very simple, not too creamy, not too much sauce something very, very pure and simple because Chablis is classic, but Chablis is classy. And- Just like you, Ben, just like you. <laughs> Thank you. No, yes, it, we, we, I think it should not be, Chablis is not too much. So it must Perfect. be just a minimum. Ben, thank you so much. Thank we'll you very much for the next one, but that was delicious. I think that's tasting beautiful now. Um, hang around, hopefully, and uh, there'll be some questions at the end, I'm sure. Um, but but uh, we'll move on to the next one for now. Thank you.
<laughs> okay, folks, um, just me talking about the next one, and I'm going to take you a little bit off piste for the second one. So um, this is Ramon de Cesar Treasure Dura 2020. Uh, this is from Galicia in northern Spain. And I chose this wine really because I just think it's um, a bit of a hidden gem, really. It's something a bit different. Um, so we've had a classic Chablis. But if you're talking about white wines to kick off um, Christmas with um, and you want to um, uh, upgrade your choices a bit, you can't go far wrong um, with this wine. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. Is from Ribeiro in um, the uh, north, north, um, northwest of uh, Spain, just above Portugal, Galicia. Galicia, perhaps more famous, uh, you'll know for for Albarino, um, or perhaps Godello. Um, those are the two other grapes uh, grown in this region. Um, but also this wonderful variety, uh, Trejadora, um, which I hadn't come across really till till a few years ago. Um, if you haven't been to Galicia, it, it's not maybe what you expect in Spain. It's very green, it's very lush. Um, if, if Ray were here, I'd say it's almost like Ireland in, it, in terms of its sort of um, uh, topography. Um, uh, so it's very green, very, you know, cool. Um, you're right by the coast there, the Atlantic um, Mediterranean coast. So you're getting all of that lovely fresh sea influence and a bit of humidity. In fact, they often grow the vines um, a little bit higher up um, to keep them away from um, from the rolling um, humidity that, that that might bring some disease into the vineyard. So it's quite an interesting um, um, place. Um, so the winemaker here, Javier uh, Gonzalez, um, and Ramon de Cesar was his father, um, and he worked in Venezuela, but was from Galicia, wanted to um, go back and uh, realise his dream of, um, you know, creating a vineyard there and championing the, the local varieties of the region. Um, Treasure Dora is, um, you might co more commonly know that variety in Portugal, where it makes that crisp, almost um, slightly spritzy uh, white wine called Vina Verde. It's the same variety. But here, um, it's a very different expression. It's more rich, a bit fuller, um, more, more sort of textural wine. Um, so I thought I might get back to basics on this one as it's just me talking and we might just talk about tasting wine. You see, uh, if you're new to all of this, welcome um, to Naked. Um, welcome to the fascinating world of wine. Um, in terms of tasting, you know, you, you'll see a lot of people swirling their wine glass like this. That's really to bring air into the wine, to open it up, to allow all of the interesting compl complex smells or subtle smells to, to, to come out of the glass. Um, so lots of people, um, Putting, putting what they can smell and taste in the chats. That's all great. I mean, it's all about fresh pear with this wine. Some white flowers, um, that kind of thing. Um, it's, a, it's an unoaked wine. It's all about letting the, the fruit shine through um, and, the, and the texture comes naturally from, from the wine itself. So I get lots of like, lemon curd a bit on the palate. Um, it's a really elegant wine, um, maybe not super punchy to start with, but it's a real grower. Um, it grows on you and it's a real food orientated wine. Um, it goes great. Lots of people are saying they can smell the sea. I mean, I, I don't think it's just psychological. This company gets the wonderful salty maritime uh, wind coming into the vineyards here and that really imparts a, a saltiness to the wine. Um, this was a decanter medal winning uh, wine this year at the at the awards. Um, it's fantastic wine. Um, I really think it's underrated, a bit of a hidden gem in the, in the naked um, um, range. Um, it's $13.99. So you had a Chablis, that's a classic choice. I think it's wonderful, um, but it, for fish dishes, um, this, this would be a good alternative. Um, I think because of maybe because it comes from northern Spain, but I think that the texture and the richness of this wine can handle slightly smokier dishes as well. Maybe, you know, a bit, some smoked paprika in the dishes, some richer vegetables and maybe some creamy sauces. Um, so there we go. Um, fly through that wine. But that's um, Ramon de Cesar Trejadura from Galicia in Spain.
Mm. Cool. Thanks very much. Right. <coughs> Wine number three. And what have we got here? So we are heading off to Australia for wine number three. Um, in the Smith household, Christmas isn't really Christmas without some, some decent Pinot Noir. Um, we're thrilled to have um, Adrian Santelin, hopefully with us uh, from Australia. Adrian, hi, how are you? Good, thanks, good to see you. Good, you've traded, um, You've traded cornflakes in the school run to come and taste wine with the with the naked guys. So thank yeah, you very yeah. much. What what time is it there? Uh, a bit after seven, seven thirty. Yeah, yeah. So um, Rebecca's got the kids and she's she's uh, got the chaos of the morning. And I've uh, zipped into the office here and uh, going to talk to you guys. Fantastic. So um, oh, it'd be great if you could just um, explain. I don't know whether everyone knows where the Yarra Valley is, um, but it'd be great if you could give us a little flavour of where you are and kind of what makes that special for the wine. Yeah, sure. So um, Yarra Valley is about 30 minutes east of Melbourne, and Melbourne's a capital of Victoria, which is Australia's southernmost state on the mainland. We always seem to forget about Tasmania. Sometimes they don't count to most people. But um, it's, it's a region that... In modern, in modern day times, we're very well known for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and they're the two most widely planted varieties. Um, historically, when the Yarra was first planted, it was all about Cabernet. Um, it's one of, it was one of the most famous Australian wines way back at like early 1900s. Um, I think it was one of the first international wines to win win a, an award at a at the Paris Wine Show. And, <coughs> Um, it sort of put Australian wines on the map and then along came Phylloxera and, and got rid of a few vineyards in certain parts of Victoria and mm. uh, and sort of also at that time Australian um, wine tastes I guess moved to fortified wines and so the Yarra Valley by the 1920s or 30s um, sort of disappeared the vineyards just sort of got mothballed and that was the end of them until sort of the 1960s 70s and 80s and the Yarra Valley made a bit of a comeback uh, once again, starting off with Cabernet and Shiraz, and but so, sort of from the 90s and onwards, it's been all about Pinot and Chardonnay. And uh, in terms of Australia's climate, we're sort of in an ideal position for, for making those two varieties. We're sort of a cool climate region. Um, there's a lot of other little regions around Melbourne and obviously Tasmania as well that um, are very well suited to those two varieties. Um, so we and the Yarra Valley is quite a small region uh, all up. Uh, the whole region itself produces about seven to eight thousand tons of fruit annually at each harvest. And to put that into perspective, um, one of Australia's largest wineries, they crush 175,000 tons annually themselves, one winery in a large region. So they're wow. totally, totally different ball game. We're, we're all about small batch premium wines. Um, and, and yeah, and obviously, yeah, we, we love Pinot and Chardonnay because that's that's the the two main varieties and and yeah uh, Pinot is the main wine that I drink all the time so it's you know it's my favorite favorite variety by far. Mm. It's incredible. I don't know whether everyone's got a if you've got a white surface at home. Um, that's that's kind of how you want to look at the color of the wine. Um, but I, I think you know for me this is a, just a beautiful color. It's translucent. Um, you can see through it. It's very mm. elegant in the glass, isn't it? Um, that's that's due to the, the sort of uh, that's that's Pinot Noir, isn't it? The, the slightly thinner skin. But I mean, is that typical of the Yarra, or is that typical of your style? I mean, how, how are you delivering such a ripe, delicious, juicy wine, but with such pale colour? Um, oh, a lot, lot of different factors. So you've got the you've got the twenty twenty. Um, Pinot in front of you and 2020 was quite a quite a cool cool year um so right there where we you know there was quite cool and rainy coming into the vintage period um so that means it took a little bit longer for the grapes to ripen we picked them quite late um and you get a much sort of a slightly lighter style pinot um 
then it goes into winemaking style and and I guess our style is to make try and deliver those elegant style wines where you know you get minerality you get elegance you get um uh a lighter wine but still it's it's got depth of flavor and complexity and I find that with Pinot even though Pinot is a lighter variety there's a hell of a lot of complexity in there when you when you sort of search for it so you know generally speaking um the you know, Pinots from the Yarra Valley, you know, they could they could have um, forest floor or mushroomy characters, or they could have strawberry and sour cherry. They could have a combination of that. Um, a typical character of the Yarra Valley is also a sort of a, a slight sappy sort of uh, character sometimes. So it de depends on the vintage. So a warmer vintage, you'll see you'll see um, a sort of a the fruit spectrum coming in at plum. Uh, uh, you might see a bit more of that sappiness. You'll probably see a bit more of that forest floor and in a cooler year um, such as this one in front of you you'll see more strawberry cherry uh, and then i guess it's it's just a more delicate and elegant wine and it's got a lovely natural acidity which means it's going to age for you know it's going to be able to age in the long term and that wine will develop um, more flavors as it as it ages so it is one that you can sell it um, and it's also but you know great to drink now so I've, just for yeah. the hell of uh, tasting. Excuse me for uh, doing this at 7.30 in the morning, but... <laughs> oh, you're yeah. a professional. You're a professional agent. That's right, that's right. I expect nothing, right. so expect nothing there's else. A little, <laughs> there's a little bit of... Um, I find a little bit of uh, spice and, and herbs in this one. Um, probably seeing more, more strawberry. Um, there's a little bit of a sweet, a hint of sweet vanilla and oak. Mm. And that's, that's part of the winemaking. So we, we try and keep things very simple. Um, so grapes are hand-picked and that's very important with Pinot. I think as soon as, if they don't get hand-picked and it's machine-picked, then you sort of lose that pinosity and it just becomes like a light dry red. So grapes are hand-picked, um, they're de-stemmed. So we're just taking the berries off the, off the stems and we maintain some whole berries and the whole berries sort of uh, give you a bit more fruit. You get that's that if you can maintain that shape, you, you deliver a little bit more of that mm -hmm. strawberry berry fruit. We do throw a few little whole bunches in the bottom of the fermenter. So that's the, you know, the whole grape yeah. cluster goes in and you get the lovely spicy, note, spicy notes yeah. from- the perfume from the and the, mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then usually it's a wild fermentation. If I have a couple of different fermenters, I might inoculate one with a selected yeast, a cultured yeast. Um, while the other one, we just let start, we let the fermentation begin naturally um, with whatever indigenous yeast is, is on the grape skins. Uh, and then once that's dry, it gets pressed off into barrel and it goes through natural malolactic fermentation where all the malic acid uh, gets converted into a softer lactic acid. And um, the wine gets, uh, stays in barrel for about 10 months uh, on all its leaves. So all the, all the sediments, all the solids in the bottom of the barrel and they release, they release, um, oh, manoproteins which is essentially something that gives you apparent sweetness without being sweet so they give you a lovely body and texture and um you know you, you it it's sort of a, so that's sort of my style with most wines whether i'm making pinot or chardonnay or even uh yeah, yeah. valley Chirac or something like that it's kind of a similar style there's little tweaks for each variety but um the, we we sort of find that after 10 months in oak that's that's the that's all it needs it seems to get its complexity it seems to soften the tannins um, and it doesn't need any more than that. Otherwise, then you start losing the, the lovely fruit flavors. Yeah. So we, you know, we're, we're, we want to, we want to, we want to create a wine that is, you know, textured and complex, but at the same time, we want it to be elegant. And that's, that's the main thing. Yeah. Well, I, I think you've totally achieved that. I was going to say, I mean, this is drinking beautifully now, now for me, because I think maybe it is because it's from that slightly cooler year, but it's got those slightly meatier savory flavors mushroom a little bit sort of you know damp forest floor or, or or whatever that make pinot noir i mean that's it's really pinot noir that get, get you know can can have those sorts of interesting flavors um so what's christmas like uh, in the in, in the santalin family right i mean where, where would you would you drink something like this what, what do you what do you eat on christmas day yeah uh, well we definitely always start with a bit of champagne rebecca loves champagne so um she she yeah she'll be very unhappy if we don't have a bit of that um, and the champagne 
Yeah, uh, always a little bit of seafood in our household. Um, and then that's where sort of our, between Rebecca and myself, our uh, views differ. She, she's very much a, a traditionalist when it comes to Christmas. So she loves things that you'd expect in a Northern Hemisphere Christmas. And I'm, yeah, okay. I grew up in a, a sort of a warm place in Australia. So, you know, stinking hot 40 degree days in at Christmas time. <laughs> last thing you want is like a, this massive hot turkey. And I'm, so I'd like, you know, <laughs> like a selection of cool, cool meat that you've, that you've cooked the day before or something like that. Um, so we do, we do have our Christmas time argument of what we're going to have, but um, uh, yeah, definitely sparkling's always first up. Then there's usually, usually a minerally Chardonnay, Yarra Valley, of course, but you know, sometimes yeah. it may be, it may be a Chablis or something like that. Yeah. And then, uh, then we move to Pinot and uh, um, I don't think we move much further than that. Pinot is just, we, we find that it goes with a lot of foods um and especially i think with with if you if you go down the path of having sort of cool meats you know just a selection of different different meats when they're when they're not hot i think pinot sort of suits them very well but if you're having something warm um you know you can't go past pinot and, and duck like it's it's such a yeah great i was gonna say i mean it, it's sort of still obviously you know it's about three or four degrees outside it's freezing today <laughs> so i'm firmly on the sort of um game birds that kind of yeah. thing but, but, but as i said before i think you know pino is definitely on our list at christmas time and you know turkey obviously um uh, but you know goose and duck a lot of people saying in the chat i mean it's that it, it, it's um i've read a lot about food and wine pairing recently and it's all all about thinking of wine as an ingredient to the food and and with the yeah. acidity in pinot noir it handles things like goose and, and and duck so well and that's just a match made in heaven isn't it yeah yeah i've, I've never i've never had goose and it's on my list to do this year so i'm I... oh you okay. go see if you can Vince Rebecca. Mate, that was yeah. awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I hope um, I hope everyone's really enjoyed that wine. It's um, fantastic. Um, so stick, stick around. I'm sure there'll be a couple of questions for you at the end to, if you can. Um, but, um, but that was great. Okay. Thank Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. Okie dokie. Right. Let's, uh, let's head on to wine number four. Um, so wine number four, um, we're off to Italy, um, and, uh, a real favorite country of mine. Um, and, um, we're hopefully going to be, ah, Stefano, you are here. We're going to be tasting Chianti Classico 2019. So I'm not. Stefano Di Blasi. How are you? You made it. I'm fine. I'm fine. And thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank, pleasure. You, thank, you, thank you for taking, thank you for taking the time. Thank you. No, Thanks it's a time. pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's an honor. <laughs> so, Stefano, we're talking all things Christmas, um, and uh, this is a selection of six um, slightly finer wines in the naked portfolio in the naked range. And I'm just I've picked six wines that I think work really well with different parts of um, Christmas. Um, a chance to try some classics and some maybe um, some some wines that maybe our customers haven't thought about. Um, so Chianti Classico, I, I love Italy, I love Tuscany. Um, you're, you're for, this is your home region, Tuscany. Um, yeah. And now you, ref, you, are, you have referred to Chianti Classico as an informal wine in, in the past, and, and, I, and I tend to agree with you there. And I think where this wine would really come into its own is um, maybe on we have Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, and we eat maybe a, a, a selection of meats or um, vegetables or ham. And, I, and I, I, when I tasted this wine, I really thought Chianti Classico would be perfect for that sort of uh, occasion. Yeah, you are perfectly right. And thank you for for putting this wine just after Pinot Noir made, uh, Pinot Noir made from Adrian, because I think there are lots of similarities. So mm -hmm. Sangiovese, which is the variety, is, is somehow similar to Pinot Noir. So it's, it's that kind of wine that it's not, it's not a huge, bold, concentrated wine. So it has some similarities. So it's, it has a, a pale color like Pinot Noir, and, uh, and yes, you're right, this is a wine that is 
part of the tradition, probably the most traditional wine that I make for, for you angels, uh, because this really brings you know, the winemaking of this wine, it's all related to the, to the tradition. And the tradition of wine in Italy is mainly related with food. So you're right, Matt. So all those kind of food perfectly matches. And, uh, and yes, for Christmas, there, there are plenty of different food in all of our houses. I can hear the same in UK, but, but in Australia as well. And, and, and this is a wine that's a bit an all-rounder, you know, can, can really match with different, different kinds of food. Um, yes, yeah, seeing that, uh, just, just to explain a little bit to our friends, angels, uh, where, where we are, what, what it is. Uh, first of all, with, with your boxes, you don't have the, the black rooster here. No. This is the symbol uh, of the Chianti Not on the taste of pack. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. on the tasting pack. It's there. It's not. On, it's it's not, not. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> yes, but I, I find it's very easy for people to remind this because this is Chianti Classico, which is different from Chianti. And only on the Chianti Classico you have this. So Chianti Classico, it's a small appellation at the end uh, because it's only six thousand hectares so compared to for example to champagne is one sixth uh, so it's, it's wow a, it's very small even mm. though you may think because of Chianti which is the larger one which is four thousand yeah. hectares uh, we are it's a small region in between Florence and Siena and this is this was traditionally one of the oldest wine region of Italy uh, it's a beautiful place to visit. I invite all our angels to come and visit Florence and Siena and then get lost in the countries and, and, and trying wines in the many, many wineries you can find there. Um, and, and yes, this is the region where I live. Actually, this is the first wine that I've made for Naked Wines eight years ago. So this is the eight vintage. This is 19. 19 was a very good vintage indeed. Um, everything went really well from the climate, the temperature, the, 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 the yield in the vineyard. So everything was just right at the right time. And um, yeah, the variety is Sangiovese. There is a little bit of, of uh, Merlot in it. And the winemaking is very traditional. So it's... Um, it's a, let's say, short fermentation maceration, let's say about two weeks. Mm -hmm. After the maceration and the, the, the end of the fermentation, the wines uh, go into the wooden cask, in big wooden casks. So we don't use barrels here, any barrels, because we don't mm -hmm. want to uh, exceed the taste of oak uh, with the wine, because the wine, it's a, it's a subtle wine. So it's, it's, it's again, it's not a huge, powerful red. Uh, so we have to respect these um, nice flavors of red cherries. Um, yeah. There is some, some nice spiciness. Uh, you can, you can sometimes find some grapefruit character. And mm -hmm. then with the aging, uh, the wine can go towards a uh, more earthy character. Uh, 19 is still quite young. So we are still on the fruity side of the life of this wine. And another character, which is very um, uh, common in Sangiovese is this fairly high acidity. Yeah. Uh, this is probably the main reason why it's it's not a it's not really an international variety because it's it's it doesn't uh, meet uh, the taste of everyone because of this fairly high acidity but that's one of the key point of uh, the, the 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 of matching this wine together with food. So because yeah. of this acidity, 
it cleans the mouth perfectly when you when you eat your food and and this is exactly the tradition so in Italy there isn't a wine without food wine it's part of the part of the dinner part of the it's lunch. an ingredient isn't it it's the it's dish it's a dish it's a side dish absolutely yeah. uh, exactly. and um, exactly. this, this is firmly designed from a place um, where you want that fresh acidity to cut through to cut through the dishes um, yeah and I see this part is now coming back in even in the in the taste in and 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 in, in, in more fashion a more fashionable taste because after we've been drinking uh, bold and rich wine that are <coughs> high alcohol and um, full of tannins then when you refine a bit your taste, you, 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 you suddenly turn into this kind of wine where you don't look for you know, the impact, but you look for the elegance and the balance, uh, which from a winemaking point of view is the most fascinating part. You, know, you try to do something that is complex without being too much. So finding complexity with little and, and, and little elements, it's, it's really a matter of balance. And this is something I, I really like. So not sure if I, I've been able to do it with this wine. I hope so. I know it's probably a wine for a niche of uh, taster and angels, but I like that Naked Wine is keeping this wine in the range because, you no. Know, I think the, the, the taste in wine is, is really subjective. So at the end, I think that there is space for this. Kind 100%. Of wine. Uh, it's a very authentic wine. Um, it's, it's a t typical wine of the region. Actually, a lot of, a lot of uh, guys saying in the chat, they wouldn't normally go for Chianti, but this is delicious. I think, you know, tasting it, it's very authentic Chianti. The color is um, just right. Again, like you say, tasting it after the Pinot Noir, you can see through it. It has a slightly orange rim um, uh, to the wine, showing there's already um, some a little bit of de development, uh, maturity to the wine. Um, but it's that elegance um, and freshness that uh, I think, that, and the balance that you've managed to keep in that wine. I, I think they did, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always thought the difficulty with Chianti is that people don't really know what to expect. There are some producers making very big, dark, um, quite oak driven Chiantis, some like you making a lighter, more authentic wine. And then there's the difference between basic Chianti and Chianti Classico, and the, the two are very, very different, different prices. And so it's all a bit confusing, I guess, a lot of the time. I know, I know, yes. And then there is also the different level of Chianti because you may have the Chianti Classico, then the Reserva, and then the Grand Selezione. Mm. There are three levels. But generally speaking now, the, 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 the wineries, they are for the Chianti Classico, like this one, which is the base, it's not a Reserva, it's not a Grand Selezione, they are all coming back to what is the tradition. Because in, in the past, it, it's been used a lot of Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, up to 20, 25% and uh, changing the, 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 the real character of the wine. Now we are going back to something that is more original, traditional, and I agree with you, this is a very good example of what a Sangiovese from this region should be. And probably now the, you know, this big variation around the taste, uh, it's, it's been reduced. Um, mm. and, I, and, and, I, and I think you're right that that was a problem because when you don't find, uh, uh, let's say, some, the similarities no, between the different, among the different bottles, then you, you don't understand what is the region. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, 100%. Um, now, uh, Christmas in the de Blasi family household must be a big occasion. I'm sure you eat and drink very well. Um, what, do, yeah. what, do the, what do the Tuscans eat? Do, do you celebrate Christmas Eve or is it Christmas Day? Uh, Christmas Day. Or both. Yeah. It's probably both. Yeah, both. Yeah, also because, you know, I'm the fifth 
of you know typical Italian family. So I'm the fifth uh, boy, <laughs> the yeah. younger, the younger okay. than now. No, I'm the younger, but I'm 50. So my my brother and sister are older than me. So there are now nephews. So we are really really big family. Too many. So sometimes we split in the eve and the, the end the day. <laughs> so not it's not possible to stay in the same place all together. Unfortunately, in the last two years, as for everyone, of we, course, yeah, we couldn't do that. But yes, somebody may remember my video doing making the tortellini. So yes, very oh, traditional, very traditional food. And um, yeah, there, 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 there are the tortellini and then uh, many, many other kind of food. I personally like uh, this. I, I don't know. I don't even know how to translate, but it's a it's a chicken uh, that is completely uh, cleaned. And then the meat is mixed with uh, uh, many different flavors, aromas and put it back and cook together. Then you cut it in slices. Uh, we, we call it galantina di pollo. I don't even know okay. how to translate, but you know, in Italy, there are hundreds of different recipes when you move yeah. from one, one village to the other. Uh, so I have to think what to cook for the next, for the next Christmas and uh, how to show in a video for our angels, but I'll yes. do something. <laughs> instructional video to make that dish i think for, for this christmas sounds sounds fun that sounds fantastic a ballotine we call it call it yeah wonderful well that's delicious um stefano thank you very much um for tasting that wine with us um i, I hope hopefully you stick around if, if there are some questions at the end um but but i, I think that chianti was delicious and i see a lot of other people really enjoying it so thank you very much thank you i'm here that's great. Okie dokie, folks. Uh, wine number five, I think. And um, so uh, off to, so off from Italy to South Africa. And I'd love to welcome Arco Larman, if he's there still. Arco. Hey, Arco, how are you doing? You can hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, loud and clear from the Cape. Yeah. There. <laughs> I, I said, you, you? Ex I'm good. Excuse the 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 mo. It's in November, and I don't yeah. usually have handlebars. So yeah. Well, it's a it's a strong look actually. I think maybe, <laughs> have you, maybe you might you might keep them going afterwards. No, no, no. I need <laughs> no. twice my life for the facial hair. The, um, the miss is not I'm allowing bit, it. <laughs> I'm a bit jealous with the um, not being able to have the six wines here. See you guys taste them all. I think. Uh, yeah. Next, um, next time we yeah. must get 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 a tasting pack over to you. Yeah. See, see how awesome. see how it goes through the mail all the way to South Africa. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so Arco, um, welcome. Um, you're uh, you're a relatively uh, recent winemaker to the Naked family. So um, I guess it, maybe this is the first time we've had you on a Zoom. Um, totally. But it's but it's great it's great to have you on board. Uh, you've got an esteemed winemaking um, heritage behind you in the Cape. Um, it'd be great. G give us a bit about your background to kick things off. Well, it's it's been uh, I've been interested in the wine industry since I was about thirteen years old, and uh, from an area that doesn't make wine up in Johannesburg, which is uh, about oh, okay. a thousand kilometers from from uh, Cape Town, Western Cape. And uh, started with a family who you know, uh, Danny Stadler. I stayed with. Uh, yeah. I started my industry with them. I was his brother from another mother, and worked worked there. And uh, from there, then worked in a mobile bottling company, and then uh, was given an opportunity to work for a, a strong brand in in Paul, and worked there for sixteen years. And I'm I'm, I'm a little bit. Uh, uh, Dean, the headlights here, standing with people from Chablis and Italy, uh, being now a, a South African winemaker who started his own business in 2017. So I left Glen Carlu, um, my previous job, and started yeah. my own business. And 
it's, it's, it's a very different way that I work. So I'm an independent winemaker, so I'm not focused to a specific region. I buy wines from different different regions. It's not that mm -hmm. I'm focused on one specific area. I'm very much a Chardonnay strong producer. Yeah. Um, but uh, saw the strength of the Cabernet you guys are tasting now, because um, I think the area that I worked in for 16 years, which is the Paul region, is a little bit underrated for what what they what they can do. Absolutely. And when I'm looking at Cabernet, I don't want green, astringent, tomato leaf uh, harshness. I, I prefer more cassis, soft berries, soft violet fruit. Um, don't overwood the wine. And um, that's why I chose to to give this wine to you guys, which is uh, um, the focal point Chardonnay from uh, the Siemensburg Paul area, uh, Siemensburg Paul area, yeah, in in Paul. So, and, yeah. so just to um, reiterate, so we're tasting focal point Cabernet Sauvignon 2019. Correct. Um, what's in the What's in the name? Why focal point? The thing is, I, I, I've, what's very important to me, and it, it, Safeco is very strongly regulated with if the little seal, you look at the back of any Safeco bottle of wine, you can trace, if you look at that seal, you know where it comes from. We literally track the wine from the vineyard through to bottling. And um, for me, focal point means like similar to photography and art. It's a... Uh, it means a specific point of interest. So if you've got a if you've got a, a photograph with one red apple in the in the photograph, you you you're focused to that that red apple, if you understand. So yeah. with me, it's about getting to the specific region with a specific style and the specific uh, variety that works well in that region. Um, so it's, it's that's that's the main name of, of the right, focal point one okay so the focal point here apart from being cabernet is pile and the and Correct. and the sort of style that that gives and what what is it what is it do you think about pile that uh, creates exciting wines for you this pile is pile is a very large area but there's certain sides like i said Siemensburg pile is the area that i'm more focused on um other areas are too hot um, mm -hmm. So in the afternoon sun is not as harsh in the Siemensburg, so you get nice cool, um, cool evenings in 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 the harvesting uh, in the uh, sorry in the um, in the uh, harvesting time, and it's more for for the style of the wine. Otherwise, if you're on the other side of Paul, where the where you see the sun's setting low, really deeply low, get more baked sort of characters and that. And this I prefer, like I said, is more softer, more clean, vibrant fruit, um, not overly extracted, not heavily alcoholic, and uh, a really great cabinet. I'm I'm a foodie, so so if you can see I'm sitting behind the fire. We we just yeah. finished the. We finished the meal last night. Um, I'm still celebrating two platter five stars. Um, I was going to congratulate you. You've done extremely well this year. Yeah. So that, that, it was. So we had, we had a roast chicken with the simso, which you guys have, and <laughs> yep. it was uh, a still in a bit of a high. Yeah. So it's almost it's eleven o'clock in the evening. So, but we uh, we are so so happy and. Uh, for me, so, Chris. So just to, for everyone who doesn't know, so Platters um, is, a, is a wine guide in, in South Africa. Um, it is the main one, and it's a real big deal uh, for anyone wondering uh, to get to get such great scores in the Platters wine guide, two five stars. So that, you know, Ar I mean, that's testament to Arco's quality in winemaking. I think very, very well deserved. But that is the sort of the main competition for, for South African wine, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah, no, that you can't, it's, it's taken me, what's interesting, I've been in the industry for 25 years, it took me, I joked with my friends, it took me 25 years to get two of these, but it only took me a year to move away from Paul and three years <laughs> in my own business to get it done, so 
I'm clearly on the right path with it. So yeah, I'm right path. Happy. You've done. You've done. You've got the recipe right. Um, finally, <laughs> by doing it on doing it on your own. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and like I said, I'm 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 a very strong foodie. So with me, this this wine that you have in your glass is like uh, obviously with the fire behind me. It's definitely um, like a slow roasted. Um, beef short rib in the oven and you finish mm. it off on 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 coals um or really really good with uh, with cheeses um old I, I'm, I'm actually dutch Laman is a dutch name so i'm what they call a car scorp, so a cheese head so i love old amsterdam the strong cheeses work really well mm. with this wine as well yeah um definitely a turkey uh Similar to um, the, uh, the the previous winemakers, um, the Chianti, the, Stefano's Chianti. No, no, um, uh, uh, is it Adrian? Adrian, sorry. Oh, Adrian's uh, Australian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're obviously warm, so, so we prefer to have colder meats and things like that. Uh, yeah. But I'm not scared to do a, a turkey or a, a 12 hour um, smoked brisket in the I've got a green egg at home, so it's like really do oh, really yeah. good Those strong cooks. strong meats, slow cooked meats, and that that with the wine. Well, and, I uh, um, I I yeah, I sort of I selected this, I guess, because I am in the UK. Obviously, um, drinking Bordeaux at Christmas time is is pretty classic. Um, and you know, if you're not drinking, if you're not having turkey on Christmas Day, and you're having roast beef or or, or something like that, um. But for me, I was just, um, this wine, for me, uh, you know, there, there are good Bordeaux at this sort of price point. But for, for me, this wine gives you everything you'd want. It's incredible bang for your buck um, at, four, you know, fourteen ninety nine. It's really serious Cabernet. But it's got the freshness. So if you're, like you say, a brisket or, or, you know, roast beef, to, to have the acidity and freshness to cut, cut through the food. Beautiful. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree with you. And it's not that I'm, I don't know this um, um, other areas, but definitely South African wines bring a, a lot of value to the to the price point. I think we're still completely underrated for what you get for the price point versus versus what you get from Bordeaux or Burgundy and that. And I understand that people travel; they one can be in Europe and you're in in Bordeaux with an a hour and a half flight. It's not not similar for us. Yeah, we drink South African wine, yeah. um, but uh, I think for, for the cleanness and and the sort of linearity of what I'm trying to do is I don't like dirty wines. I like mm -hmm. wines that show freshness, fruit can age but can be drunk now um, and will will also hold for the next ten or twelve years. Mm, beautiful and um so um when i was on tour last week um with some of the winemakers we were talking about sort of food matches and i got a bit of a bashing from rightfully so uh, from one of our angels said why don't you ever recommend any vegetarian dishes or anything like that it's not just you know meat and fish and and that that sort of thing and uh, so i started reading a bit about uh, this sort of thing because i thought right we've got we've got to start recommending vegetarian dishes very you know seriously um and um you know it's really uh, important to think of the sort of the components of the wine, what you can taste um, from the wine to direct you in, in terms of your sort of choices. So um, I think with, with the, you know, with this sort of wine, if, if, if everyone's sort of smelling it and tasting it, you're getting that bright cherry, you're getting some cherry characters, some perfume, some sort of cassis fruit, but lots of kind of mouthwatering acidity. Um, so it's just about thinking of dishes um, that 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 acidity is going to work well with like i guess you know brown vegetables so it might be aubergines or but it, but it, but the acidity of tomatoes have you got any great vegetable dishes in mind that you think this cabernet would would go great with well it, 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 it's it's funny you say that because that is what i also have on my tasting note is um like a, a really good vegetable lasagna last night i did a um 
I try, we also try not to eat as much meat. Um, mm. And one forgets how vast the naked wines group is that you got so many people that you, I'm also careful about what to say and not careful, but you want to also think of other people. Um, so I did a ricotta, um, tomato, uh, bell pepper, mushroom, uh, lasagna last night. I didn't have it with the wine, but that's something that can definitely work. Or like a, yeah, definitely like a, a Parmesan a Milanzani um, with, yeah. with with strong cheese can really work very well. And yeah, I, I, when I do the tasting, I said you try and think vegetarian, not vegan all the way, vegetarian yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, yeah, it's just uh, it, it, it's it's. Uh, I guess the wine industry is uh, guilty of it being a bit of a cop out up until now, have, haven't they? They sort of come up with the same stuff. Um, somebody asking what I meant by brown veggies. It doesn't sound very appetizing. I know. I suppose I mean, um, what do I mean? Like onions, um, aubergines, kind of roasted yes. autumn yeah. vegetables, maybe some squash. But I think it's the acidity with tomato, strong cheese, tarts, onion tart, um, yes. those kind yes. of things, um, beans casserole of beans a cassoulet type thing mm, um, onion tart you're making me hungry yeah? onion is my yeah. favorite vegetable oh yeah I, I, I can spend an hour and a half standing in front of the front of the oven roasting him. <laughs> we'll have a we'll have a, a zoom special just on the subject of onions onion next time we speak to yeah but brilliant th uh, th thanks so much for your support and um i really appreciate being here with uh, winery said I've got a way longer history than me um, but I really appreciate seeing you guys and uh, hopefully we can travel next year and do a road show and meet all your lovely angels and uh, finally toast a glass together oh that'd be magic um well yeah it's it, it's it's been planned so i'm and i'm sure it will be possible and we look forward to having you over here and creating you know developing our history together over time so um but you know fabulous uh, wine i think everyone's really enjoyed that um keep on in case there are any questions um uh but yeah but thanks very much arco thanks matt thanks so much i'll stay on cheers yeah Right, guys, so we're on to the final wine of the evening. Um, so here we go, wine number six, um, Chateau Jas de Bresse, Chateau Neuf de Pape. Um, so um, definitely the wine uh, to end with. It's um, rich, robust uh, Chateau Neuf. Um, so let me just pour some in. Um, so here we go. Um, Frederick Meyer is the winemaker. Um, and Chateauneuf, as you all know, uh, it's in the um, Southern Rhone. Now, uh, the, the vineyard, uh, he works with old vines. We talked about um, old vines with um, Benjamin at the start of the call when we were talking about Chablis. Um, and here uh, in, in these Chateauneuf de Pat vineyards, um, Frederick's working with at least 80 year old vines. So really, really quite old. And what that does is, as, as Benjamin said, that the vines dig deep down into the soil. Um, and particularly in, in Chateauneuf de Pat, uh, where the sto soil is very stony, uh, the wines, the vines really need to dig down deep to get access to water um, and, and the sort of mineral content of the soil. So um, really using old vines in Chateauneuf, uh, as it is everywhere, is, is, is a bonus um, and, and gives more complexity um, to the wine. Um, so this is a blend um, in Chateauneuf de Pat there, believe it or not, there are 13 permitted grape varieties uh, that you can use. I'm not going to name all 13 of them, um, but um, th it, luckily for me, uh, Frederick's only working with three uh, predominantly. So it's mostly Grenache, 80% Grenache, 15% um, Syrah and 5% Mourvedre. So um, Mourvedre, you, you also find in the south of France, in Spain, um, and uh, it's called Mataro in Australia as well. And all three of those um, great varieties absolutely love the sunshine. Um, they really soak it up. You can throw um, um, as, much, as much sun as you need um, at them. And um, so, uh, 
And the other unique thing in Chateauneuf de Pape is the soil. I, I, I mentioned that before. They have these um, uh, these huge stones in the in the vineyard called galette, um, or we would call them pudding stones. Really big stones. Um, so you get this wonderful sunshine coming into the vineyard um, during the day. Uh, and then the, the stones soak up all of the heat of the sun and then they radiate it back into the vineyard um, at night. So, you know, you really need uh, vines and, and varieties that can handle handle the heat. Um, Chateauneuf is pretty much the sunniest part of France. It's, it's the same amount of sunshine as Los Angeles in America. So it really is um, particularly, particularly sunny. And then you've got this wonderful warming effect of the stones. Um, so this is a real, for me, Chateauneuf is a real Christmassy wine. Um, you get um, because it's Grenache, you're not getting more, you're not getting dark fruit flavors. You're actually getting, even though it's a big, rich, um, full-bodied wine, you're getting more of those sort of raspberry ripple um, aromas, leather, licorice. It's quite a complex wine. Um, Frederick, you, you uh, harvest the grapes um, slightly later uh, on, on in these vines, and they, they are really robust. So he also um, releases the wine a bit later. Um, so, so the wine you've got in your glass is 2017. So it is a little bit more evolved. You're getting some, and what you get with with bottle age, if 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 you didn't know, um, you just get the wine um, add gets more complexity. It starts to smell of a lot more different things, maybe some more meaty characters, some more leathery characters. And what I love about Chateauneuf is all of those start to come out in the wine quite early in its life. Um, but like, like most wine, most great wines, it has structure and acidity so that you know you can age it for, for a very long time um, afterwards. So uh, this is, as I said, this is 2017 uh, vintage. 2017 in Chateauneuf was um, extremely small harvest. Um, uh, it was a very drought affected year and it was the smallest harvest in 40 years. Um, and I guess what that's done to this wine is it's concentrated everything uh, even more in the wine. So you're getting all of those leathery, spicy, Christmassy characters and it's really, really concentrated. And I just, yeah, I think that that's, I wanted to show you this wine. I think it's a classic Christmas uh, number. Um, it's, it's actually really versatile wine. It has the freshness. So, but I think it's really among, you know, it's for game, game meats, beef. Um, but Chateauneuf goes brilliantly with hard, strong cheeses. Um, so if you're maybe you don't want something like port with your cheese course afterwards, you know, something like Chateauneuf, um, brights, red fruits would work brilliantly. Um, then, you know, um, thinking um, back to um, some more meaty vegetable uh, dishes, lots of mushrooms, maybe cassoulet of beans, um, that, that those kind of vegetable dishes work really well with this wine. Um, yeah, there we go. So it's not heavy in the glass. You can still see um, a little bit through the wine. It's still got lots of freshness, but it's got that lovely sort of menthol, maybe a bit of coal dust in it. Um, bright cherry, raspberry fruit flavors. Soft tannins, it's not, it's not big structure. It's quite soft. Grenache is quite a thin skinned variety. Um, so it's still it's still got some e elegance despite its 14 and a half, 15 percent percent alcohol. So I hope you enjoyed that last wine. Um, hope you enjoyed all of the wines. Um, I think it would be great now to take some questions if we have them. Um, so let's see what we got here. Um, so there we go. Right. Um, get the winemakers, winemakers back uh, um, if they'd like to join in. So what do we have? So um, first question, there's a lack of Chianti options on the Naked Wine website. Will we be adding more? 
Well, that's a good question. Yes, there are a lack of PMTs. In fact, maybe there's just one. Um, and Stefano mentioned that there are a number of um, levels of Chianti. Uh, when he was talking, there's Chianti Classico, there's Reserva, where the wine has to spend some more time in oak and some more bottle time. There's Gran Selezione, which is the sort of pinnacle of the selection. Um, so I think it's something um, we need to look at. Um, we mentioned it. it Chianti can be a bit of a niche wine. Um, it's not to everyone's taste, but I think it's all about working with the right people, Stefano, uh, and creating a wine style um, that is um, sort of approachable but authentic. Um, Stefano, would you say there's anything, what's, what's really exciting in Chianti? What would you tell me to add to the range if you were, if you were in, in charge of the range? Uh, yeah, Matt. Actually, if I if I should say something, I think a good idea could be to add maybe a Gran Selezione to the Fine Wine Club, for example, because right. I think now the Chianti Classico is making this Gran Selezione in a very pure way. It's a very pure Sangiovese, so it's really something similar and for me somehow better than the Brunello di Montalcino. Mm, better and, and yeah, better value. And better value for sure. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Uh, question. So uh, maybe let's, uh, Arco, why don't you answer this one? On a, on a food, you're a foodie, food matching tip. Do you have any recommendations for a sort of medium spiced goat curry? Man, I like goat. My wife doesn't want to eat it. I, I like rabbit. My wife doesn't want to eat it. <laughs> goat yeah yeah no, no it's awesome look goat with um a, a slow roasted then with like a um a red beetroot um uh, yogurt uh on top uh yeah no it's it's something mm. it's not very common in south africa um but goat no yeah it, it, you have to you have to really look for it it's not something you're going to see all the time, but um, and what would you drink with it, Arco? What would wash down the goat curry? I think I'm thinking Adrian's sort of Pinot. I think reckon oh, yeah? a, a Pinot Noir can work there. Um, look, I'm I'm 95 percent a white wine drinker, um, and if it's if it's light style wines, it's going to be Pinot, Cinso, like I make, um, and that type of thing. Um, but I don't think goat needs heavy, 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 heavy dishes. Definitely not. Cool. Anyone else? Hazard a guess? Or should we move on? <laughs> Thank you, Arco. Um, another one for you, actually, Arco. Sorry. Um, customer really enjoyed Glen Carlo several years ago. How close are your reds to the Grand Classique? Um, that, that, Definitely in, in, in that style, um, because it, because I'm still drawn to Paul and, and the Siemensburg for for the, the softer reds. Um, the Grand Classique was a Bordeaux blend, so they had all five Bordeaux varietals, Cabernet Merlot, um, Petit Vido, Malbec, Cabernet Franc, in different variants every year. Um, I am a bit more of a classic wine maker, so I stick to the to the varietals i'm not brave enough to make a blend after three four years in my own in my own um business uh, when you tie your money up into into wine it sits there for a couple of years so um but uh yeah uh, one of my best vintages i think was like 2008 with them um but it just just shows you that paul has, has got a lot of uh, potential um and there's a bit of a hidden gem with regards to old vines. Um, there's, a, there's a big push with old vines and Sinso specifically. Um, that's why I'm doing a Sinso, um, which you guys have have the Plata 5 so one now. Um, but it's more more in these regions that are less less 
not as strong as, as Stellenbosch and uh, Constantia and Elgin and that type of thing. But I think Paul in the next year or two will 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 start shining a little bit with Shenans and Sinso and, uh, and that type of thing. Oh, um, yeah, that was another question. Which were your two platter five stars? So the Sanso we've got, and what was the other one? The Sinso and the Focal Point uh, Chardonnay. Um, which which mm. was in the rescue case when I just started with you, and I'm negotiations with Ray and so on to see if you guys want to. I'm going to have to allocate a certain amount, so I'm going to have to talk to, to you in and them. High demand, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, high yeah. Demand. Um, that's cool. Um, question for all the winemakers. So um, let's go and turn. Um, of recent vintages what's been your favorite vintage um so adrian what's your favorite of your recent vintages uh, we've been pretty fortunate in the yarra the last few years it's almost as if uh climate change didn't didn't exist 2019 was very warm but 17 18 20 and 21 were all really cool and mild so uh can i say four out of the last five vintages are my favorite because uh yeah, Pretty we've, lucky, yeah. We've literally made, you know, if you get a Pinot or a Chardonnay from the Yarra Valley from any producer from 17, 18, 2021, they're going to be cracking wine. So we're, we're very fortunate. Um, this year, we've had a lot of spring rain and it's continued on now. So this year could be a bit more challenging. We'll see how it pans out. But yeah, we're, we're like I said, very fortunate. Nothing that a master winemaker like yourself can't handle. Yeah. Um, Stefano, how about you? How how are you? How are the recent Tuscan vintages? They've all been pretty good, haven't they? Uh, yeah. Seventeen was dry and hot, but uh... then you know when you ask to the winemaker, the last is the best. <laughs> always, yeah, yeah. always the best. Oh. <laughs> best Every of the year. century. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, to be honest, this last one's been really, really good from a quality point of view. Unfortunately, quantity-wise, oh, it's yeah. been, wouldn't say disaster, but you know, it's probably 20, between 25, 30% less. But yeah. it's, been, it's been fantastic for the quality. So um, just, just on that point, interesting, when we talk about uh, vintage conditions, um, very small vintage because of climactic events, if it's a spring frost or, or whatever, why does that often create a really good quality, Stefano? Uh, you know, uh, in in general, lower crop uh, makes the the, the, the vine uh, concentrate everything better. So this year, it's, it happened naturally. We've had the frost in April, so the, there has been a reduction of the crop, and then a very little amount of water during the summer. So, but generally, no, if you have too much drought and heat, you don't have a right ripening of the grape. Fortunately, this year, what was really exceptional was the, uh, the extreme, the, 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 the difference between day and night temperature. So we've had a very low temperature during the last two months before the harvest. So like we've had always below 20 degree and during the day, not more than 35. So just a perfect- Nice summer. and moderate. Mm. Wonderful. And Benjamin, how about you? Um, this year was a similar story, a eh? very small crop, but high quality. Yes, and very, very small crop. We lost uh, something like uh, 60 to 70 percent of uh, uh, compared to a normal uh, harvest. Uh, so it's uh, it's a nightmare quality wise. It's quite balanced, but uh, I would say probably not as good as 2020 or 2019. 2019 it was an amazing balanced vintage with everything was absolutely perfect. The acidity was there, the, the maturity was there, the freshness, everything was there. Mm. For me, for the recent uh, vintages, 2019 was perfect. Uh, personally, I really loved 2001 in Chablis, 2014, 2017, because it's very, very high level of acidity, which I'm always trying to, mm. to find. I love freshness. 
freshness. Yeah. Right? Freshness. Mm. Even uh, for aging, because I see there is a question about aging. Yes. And even uh, for aging, uh, my my belief is that uh, if you want to age well, a wine, you must have a good structure and a good acidity to, mm. to age better. Because what we ask to an old wine, the quality of an old wine, of course, is evolution. But in a way, it's to be still young when you open it. When everything is done, when you open it, just because it's old, no pleasure. So if you have a quite high level of acidity, most of the time it's, it, it fits with aging, with longer yeah. aging. The acidity is a preservative and it allows it to age slowly and over time and relaxed of, and yeah. Of course, as long as it's balanced. Yeah, because with the fruit. It, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. A quick question. A yeah. Quick question. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Um, I, I, I'd like to know. I'll see on the side here. How how did the tasting packs um, handle? Uh, when were when were they decanted, and how did they um, how did they perform? Good. Well, they perform brilliantly. Um, we've been working um, with, with a company um, exclusively uh, for about six months. Um, Ray's been looking at the sort of quality protocol of using these tasting packs. We really wanted to get them right before we started rolling them out. Um, and uh, I won't go into all of the technicals, but if you want sure. to know the background behind it about decanting the bottles and um, spargium with nitrogen but everything to keep it um, brilliantly but we, we taste all of the the bottle against the tasting pack before we send out all of the tasting packs and we're really really happy with what the guys are doing um, we think it's fantastic to be able to do these zoom calls with you guys and 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 all of our angels and for us unfortunately we couldn't get tasting packs to you to you winemakers um, but to, to all um, experience the same thing together and they come through the letterbox and it's um, so we're very happy with the process and we'll be doing a lot more of these I think um, you know next year yeah for sure it's super awesome I think it's very very cool well yeah. done to you guys oh good thank you um, uh, question uh, I guess it must be it's to me on the Chateau Neuf de Pape has it got any Mourvedre in it yes it has got Mourvedre in it. it's Grenache predominantly Syrah and a small amount of uh, Mourvedre uh, in it somebody else being mean to me and asking me what my favorite wine of the night was well I picked all six of them so I'm not going to yeah. be drawn on that. I, I would like <laughs> all of them in one dinner party uh, for various reasons and different foods, as we've already said. So I'm going to be a, a politician and sit on the fence and bumble my way through that answer and, and not give anyone information. So uh, there we go. Um, so let me just check all of these questions. Um, you know, I've, Lots of customers saying for more South African wines. We've got a really good, big South African portfolio. It's something that we have uh, we really love at Naked. We've um, championed through COVID um, for, for helping out the industry, but also because we believe South Africa offers loads of value and interest. Um, so, uh, you know, we've got, we've got a big, pretty big portfolio, but we can always look at um, what's exciting. Um, are all of tonight's winemakers open for visits, harvest permitting? Do you all have cellar doors? Ben, Benjamin in Chablis, can people come and visit you? Maybe, maybe not. It's quite yeah. difficult. It's quite yeah. difficult because we are not structured and we are only two people in the company plus a part-time. So yeah. it's, uh, to be honest, we don't have time to welcome people properly currently but if we grow a bit maybe we will hire somebody to do it exclusively but uh, for now it's uh, it's it's not very easy but if people contact us we always try to find some time yeah. for them That's we always fantastic. Try, but uh, they should be not uh, too demanding <laughs> if we are not yeah. available 
you know, you're, you're, you're concentrating on the vineyards and the winemaking. And uh, no, we understand that's complete, completely normal. Um, Adrian, you're, uh, I mean, the Yarra is a, a, a hot spot for cellar door visits, being so close to Melbourne. Um, lots of weddings happen up there. Do, do you partake in all of that? Or? Uh, well, I've, my situation is a little bit unique. Um, I, our winery is actually inside a larger winery. So oh. um, if anyone contacts me, I'm happy to show them through and I can show them the, the, entire, the entire site. Um, and the bonus of that is then you can go to the cellar door of the other winery as well. Um, but we are opening our own cellar door off site in January, 2023. So we'll have our own site then. Fantastic, that's great, great development, great development. How about you, Arco? Um, yeah, a similar situation. We actually gonna build build a home quite soon and I plan to do wine dinners and that, that type of thing on the property. Um, with COVID, we've just recently yeah, moved to possible. a complete, complete different part of the, part of the world. And um, I reckon by 2023, definitely. But there's there's a thing or two that we we will talk about in a, a Zoom meeting with the compadres from South Africa. We can see what we can do. That'd be awesome. Yeah, brilliant. And Stefano, do you have a palatial uh, estate to visit? Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's possible. Sure. And especially where the Chianti Classico is produced, it's a beautiful villa from the 16th century. It's an wow. amazing place to visit. It's Fattoria di Montecchio. And uh, there is the, the possibility for sure to do it. There are thousands of visitors every year. So mm. you're welcome. Wonderful. There is uh, no, yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing better than visiting the place that the wines come from. Um, uh, it is uh, special and um, particularly in Tuscany, I can imagine. Yeah, wonderful, fantastic. Um, winemakers, uh, I've gone over time. Uh, you've been wonderful. Thank you for giving up your mornings, your late, it's so Adrian morning, Arco late night, um, our European winemakers. Um, there's, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Angels, I hope you've uh, enjoyed the tasting as much as I think we have. Um, and uh, so thanks for coming along. Um, join Ray on the 14th of December to taste um, some more wines for Christmas and meet some more of our winemakers. And uh, look out for a, um, a special um, special unboxing vid of, uh, of the Christmas cases that you've been uh, all receiving uh, recently. That should be quite a lot of fun. Um, but for now, thank you very much, winemakers. Um, it's been great. Uh, and I'll bid you all a good evening. Thanks, thank Matt. You. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.